Hi everyone, welcome back to the next lecture in the Spectroscopy Unknown course. And last time we discussed degrees of unsaturation, which should always be the first step that you take when you are attempting to solve an unknown structure. Now, it will obviously depend on what you are given uh, by your professor or what you have available in your classroom. But sometimes if you don't have that molecular formula, you will have a mass spectra instead, or you might have both. So this is the next step uh, that you should be looking at in that process. So today we're going to discuss utilizing the mass spectra um, when we are looking at compound analysis. So if you have a mass spectrum, this will be of help. Now, there are three major uses that we can get out of a mass spec in reference to solving an unknown. Now you'll see I've made notes on the first two, and we'll discuss those in one second. The first is that you can identify the molar mass of the compound. Now, this is useful because if you have a proposed compound, you can always add up the mass of the atoms and then check it against the mass spec, uh, specifically the M plus peak, and see if those match. Uh, number two, you can identify chlorine and bromine via their isotope peak. So there will be M plus two peaks that are very characteristic, and we will take a look at an example of that later but those are going to be present on mass spec. And then number three, you can identify important fragments leading to chunks of unknown structure, all right? Now, all three of these are important and vital. However, you can see the note that I have down here. It becomes redundant information for the first two points if the formula is provided. So if you are given a molecular formula where you can calculate the degrees of unsaturation, you then at that point do not really need the molar mass of your compound because you could get that from your formula. And you also do not need to look for the peaks to identify chlorine or bromine because you would find chlorine or bromine present in the molecular formula. So at that point, it only really becomes useful for point three, which is you can identify important fragments or chunks that lead to the unknown structure. Now, I tend to encourage students not to focus too much on the mass spec, but to go to the IR because you can find certain functionalities and functional groups there. And then the NMR is where you're really going to have the largest amount of information in terms of solving for unknown structures. But mass spec can still be important. And most people are handed mass specs when they do get these types of problems. So it would be useful to know how to utilize them. All right, so the M plus peak is going to be associated with the molar mass. That is going to be the peak that you will most likely find furthest up on the M over Z scale, which is mass over charge. That's how the mass spec works. And you will also see some peaks sometimes that go beyond that. So you can find carbon 13 peaks. Those will show up at M plus one. Now the reason for that is that the most abundant type of carbon is carbon 12. And so when we have carbon-12, about 99% of all carbon in a compound is going to be carbon-12. But approximately 1%, and these are approximate because there's also carbon-14 as well, but approximately 1% is going to be carbon-13. So you can see 1% is enough that you can usually see, let's say that you have your M plus peak, you can a lot of times see a very, very tiny peak at M plus one. Um, and the M plus one peak, that's due to the carbon 13 presence. That additional neutron is adding to the mass and therefore you see the peak that's one, one degree up in the MZ scale. And then for the halides, it's M plus two. And that comes from the uh, chlorine and bromine. So you have chlorine 35 and you also have chlorine 37 and the ratio of these are 75% to 25% for the 37. So you're going to see about approximately a 3 to 1 type of behavior when you see the ratio of those peaks. And then for bromine you have bromine 
79. And again, there are other isotopes. These are approximations. And you have bromine 81. And these two share an approximate 50-50 ratio to one another in terms of their relationship. So you would see two peaks of equal height, one at M plus and then another at M plus two. All right, so something else I wanted to mention here, the base peak, okay, is the most abundant signal. So some people will confuse the what's called the parent peak or the M plus peak with the base peak. Now, the M plus peak can be the base peak, but it tends to be a rather rare occurrence. Usually there's a, another peak that is going to be the most abundant signal. And by abundant, we mean when you're going up along, I'll show you here. Okay, the relative intensity, as you're going up along the y-axis here, the peak that hits the highest relative intensity is going to be the base peak. All right? Now, the base peak is representative of your most common fragment ion that you are going to find in your mass spectrometer. So a lot of that is going to have to do with stability because as mass spec goes along, it bombards the molecule with energy. You form these cation charges and these radicals. And then as those hit the detector, you start to pick up the relative intensity and the M over Z ratios. When you have certain fragments that are more stable than other fragments, specifically if we're talking about positive charges, right, then you are going to end up with base peaks uh, with the common, the, the ion that's occurring most often, and therefore it's going to be the most stable ion. All right. I have a video and I will link it at the end of this um, particular lecture right here. And it goes into a little bit more detail about M plus peak versus base peak. It's a pretty simple concept to grasp once you understand, uh, but I'll link that at the end of this video. All right, so let's take a look at an example here. This is for pentane, uh, just regular hydrocarbon pentane. So if we were to analyze this a bit, we see the base peak that we looked at a moment ago. We also see there's an M plus peak right here, okay? Now, it's a little bit difficult to see, but if you look right here, we have 70, 71, and 72 is the M plus peak. And it turns out that pentane does have a molar mass of 72. Now, if you look right next to that at 73, there is a very, very tiny peak, which is right here. Okay, that very tiny peak is the M plus 1 peak. So that peak is due to the C13 content that might be found somewhere in the pentane molecules that are being used to bombard the detector on this mass spec. And then we see some other peaks here. So we're going to analyze a couple of them, especially the base peak. So first of all, what is the structure of pentane? Well, pentane is going to be CH3, right? A couple of CH2s here, and then another CH3. So if we were to add all this up, the carbon, this is approximate math here. We're not going out any decimal places. You have five carbons. They're at 12 apiece, right? And then you would need to add that to the hydrogens, of which we have 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So there's going to be 12 hydrogens at one apiece. So if you multiply those and add them up, the 12 times 5 is 60 plus 12 is going to be 72, right? So if we have 72, that matches up with the M plus peak that we have right there. So that makes sense. So what's going to happen is you will get all sorts of different fragments, and that's what all of these different peaks represent. So we're just going to look at some of the most common ones that might happen. So first of all, we could split a methyl group off of here, right? And let's just keep track of this. This is 72 M over Z. If we were to split the methyl group off, we would get a butyl group. And the butyl group 
if you add all of this up, we basically took 15 away from this because a methyl is 12 plus the three hydrogens would be 15 at one apiece. So this peak would show up at 57 m over z. So if I go up here, I would expect to find a peak at 57, right? So here's 55, 56, and then here is 57. So this would be the butyl group that I have down there. Now I would also expect that I've got other fragments. So if I went and I split off again, let's say this time I split it into a propyl. If I add up the propyl, I'm going to end up with 43 m over z. And sure enough, if I go up and I look, 43, here's 40, so it's 40, 41, 42, and then here's 43. The base peak is 43, right? Now 42 and 41 also look to be pretty decent peaks there. And what's most likely happening is we're removing hydrogens from the base peak. So from this butyl group, we're just taking hydrogens off. But clearly the butyl group seems to be the favored fragment for stability purposes here. And we'll discuss that in just a minute after we finish this. So again, we could also go down to an ethyl. And if we had an ethyl group, that would be 29 m over z. Okay, and keep in mind these would all likely have positive charges associated with them, right? And then finally, the methyl group, which would be 15 m over z. All right, now keep in mind, we wouldn't expect the methyl group to be as large because with a methyl group, a methyl carbocation is not stable at all. So sure enough, if we go up and we look at 15 here, we barely see, it almost looks like the M plus 1 peak. So we do not form methyl carbocations to an appreciable extent. However, that ethyl group at 29, that's this one right here. Okay, so that looks relatively similar to the butyl group. So that's a plausible fragment. We could potentially have something like that. Now, why is it that the butyl group, um, I'm sorry, that the propyl group is the base fragment? Well, when we look at it, okay, if you take the propyl group and you also see what it split off into, which would be CH2, CH3, okay, both of these groups avoid any type of methyl formation. So in other words, whether I have the plus here or whether I have the plus here, the split does not leave any type of CH3 group like this by itself. Okay, now the way that some of this works, you also form radicals, so you'll get plus charges and radicals. Radicals have the same stability as carbocations due to their location in p orbitals. And so you're looking at the same type of trend whether you're dealing with the cations or the radicals. Now, the reason that we are again trying to avoid this is that methyl carbocations are not stable. These do not have any hyperconjugation. They do not have any ability for rearrangement. And so if you're going to be in a case that is going to start generating methyls, it tends not to be a favored site. And so this most likely leads to the base peak being the propyl group right there. All right, now I'm going to be a little bit shorter with this one, but benzyl chloride, there's two things I want to highlight here. So the first one is that we've got the M plus peak, and you can see the M plus 2 chlorine isotope for benzyl chloride. So if I were to draw benzyl chloride, it's a aromatic ring, benzene ring, and it's got a CH2 group here and then a chlorine coming off of it. Okay, so the chlorine, we can see the M plus peak. And then right here, if you look right there, you can see a peak that's about one third the size. So it's a three to one ratio when we're looking at those peaks. If you ever find a peak too 
away from the M plus peak, so the M plus two peak, that has this type of pattern, then you can pick up on a halide. And again, if it was a bromine, they would be equal in height. All right, so then we don't have a whole lot left here except for, now there's very tiny peaks, but there's a very prominent peak at 91. 91 is for a benzyl cation. And this is so prominent compared to all of the others because the benzyl cation has excellent resonance stability. So you're forming a cation with the removal of the chlorine that would look like this. And when you have something that looks like this, you are going to get fantastic stability of that cation around the aromatic ring through delocalization of the charge. All right, so the point here is that sometimes, this is at 91 m over z, Sometimes you have characteristic peaks that show up at certain M over Z uh, fragments, and you know that that's a very iconic or classic type of peak due to stability. Now, if you end up picking up the guide that goes along with this course, you can help support us by picking up the guide at our website at chemcomplete.com. I have in that guide an entire table of the most common fragments that you'll come across. So one of the appendices in the unknown structure uh, manual is going to list basically starting with some of the lowest M over Z's all the way up into approximately like 100 or so. Um, it gets a little higher than that. But you'll see all of these possible different common peak fragments that you may come across. It's a very useful reference guide. All right, but that's pretty much it. So you can identify nice big chunks of information from your mass spec if you know where to look. However, as I stated previously, I would not spend massive amounts of time on mass spec compared to IR and especially compared to NMR. That's where you want to spend the bulk of all of your efforts is uh, the proton NMR especially and also the C13 NMR. So that wraps this one up. Uh, as I just mentioned a moment ago, be sure to check out the description and go visit our website. We offer one-on-one -on -one mentoring and tutoring now. You will be able to work directly with me. Uh, we also offer the guides for purchase, and that's expanding all the time as we're releasing these courses for you guys. And any type of channel interaction is appreciated. If you subscribe, you'll be up to date with our uh, lessons and activity. Any comments, I do my best to respond to, and always... Dropping a like on the video helps with the engagement. So until next time, I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of the day, and we will see you guys in the next lecture for IR spectroscopy.